nucleus, it's really all about not making any major mistakes. Uh, so what this course does is it sort of spans the basic to the advanced, but, uh, and I'm gonna show you some things that I think are uh, advanced techniques that may or may not make sense. I think a lot of them are controversial, but they're things that uh, I have uh, found useful. But the principle that uh, I think we should talk about at the very outset is that um, I think it's really important to know yourself and what your uh, sort of tendencies are. And I think that too, all too often we're worried about what the patient will say when we have to talk to them afterwards uh, in terms of having a uh, complication. So maybe I'm going to start actually by asking the panel, um, you know, what do you say to a patient when you've had posterior capsule rupture and a retained nucleus? Because if you think about it, um, if, you know, I ask this often to the residents, what's the single worst thing you can do with the fake nucleus as a cataract surgeon? You know, I used to think, well, if you detach decimates, that's a big problem, but now if you can do a DMEC or a DSEC, uh, a lot of the residents will say you drop the nucleus, that's the worst thing. And of course, uh, Brian showed it. The worst thing you can do with a faker tip is to aspirate vitreous because even though you, we have good vitreoretinal surgeons, it's at least a 50% incidence of PVR when you have a giant retinal tear. And if you have PVR, that's how you get a tysical eye. So think about that, and uh, that should be in the back of your mind. And yet, all too often, we sort of plunge ahead because we think that having to send the patient for a second operation is the worst thing. And part of that is our uneasiness with you know, talking with the patient. So let's just take a moment and, and ask uh, our experts here, what do you say to a patient? Because this is something you should actually mentally rehearse in advance. So if that's the worst thing and you rehearsed it, well, then you won't fear having to do that. So start with Brian. Thanks, David. Yeah, I mean, we all, we all at some point have to do the sort of walk of shame after, after we get a <laughs> um, complication like that. And you just have to retain the humility to say sorry. Um, and you've got to apologize, explain, and support. Um, and that's very important because you know, someone, a patient that's just had a new that's dropped is going to be very frightened they're going to go blind. And there is a small, a small chance that, that they may do, and that one has to sort of face it honestly. And, and, but if you do apologize and you explain immediately, I mean immediately after the surgery, you've got to do it, when you're feeling at your worst and they're feeling at their worst. So it's not a comfortable thing to do. But um, for all of us that have been involved in medical legal sort of litigation over the years, um, the worst and most successful litigation against surgeons has occurred not because of what happened, but how they behaved. It's very clear, it's how you behave that matters. And people won't sue you if they like you. And they will like you if you, they feel that you care about what's happened and that you have explained to them that you haven't hidden anything and that you're there to support them and you're accessible to them and you reply to their letters and their emails. So I think one has to say apologize, so explain and support. Great. Amar? Uh, if we get a PC rupture drop nucleus in a main hospital, immediately the case is shifted for me to manage. So we don't. Uh, complicate the story. The story is the nucleus drop will be managed there itself. If it's from other center, the case is again referred to us and we tell them straight away there was a problem. But another small issue is I see post operative, and I tell you honestly, I had a doctor from Columbia who had come to be trained and she'd come with a mother. And when I saw the mother, some top surgeon had operated, but there was a small fragment lying in the AC. If you have a small <coughs> fragment lying in the anterior chamber, nucleus, I tell you what, remove it. Many times we say leave it behind, but I tell you what, those rub the endothelium and you start getting a decompensation in that area. So if you have a small fragment post-operatively which you see, go to the OR, take those small fragments also out because that will be the best. And finally, the tip I would like to say is if you have a rupture, nucleus not gone down, bring it above the iris, do a little bit of vitrectomy, implant the three-piece iodine into the area above the iris. So now you have a scaffold and then you can very safely phaco the nucleus now your pupil is small, use iris hooks, assess how much of rexus you have, then you can decide whatever technique of implanting the IOL is. Uh, I have the big advantage of having my husband as a retinal surgeon. But you say it was his fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, sometimes 
uh, your ego hurts you, so I don't give it up easily. So as soon as you have a PCR, do not remove your phaco probe in a hurry. If possible, through the side port, inject in some viscoelastic, which viscoat or anything, whatever you have. In my case, I have a methyl cellulose. And I put a suture, as Dr. Amar said, if, if the nucleus is still not gone down, I will try to use a globe stabilization rod and try to bring the nucleus anteriorly, leave it, put a suture on the main port, and conveniently, I will hand it over to my husband. Like to manage. <laughs> so my, my comments are, uh, I think, put yourself in the patient's shoes and what are the questions you would have when you would be told that? One is, whose fault is it? <laughs> Two, why didn't Dr. Chang take out all the cataract? Uh, I mean, the doctor left some of the cataract still in the eye. Three, uh, what's going to happen to me now? Am I going to go blind? Four is, does, does anyone, does he appreciate how traumatic this is and how difficult it is to be told that? And so if you think about that, those are the things you have to address. Uh, typically, you're rushed, it's unexpected, you're now behind schedule, and you don't have time to sit with the patient. The patient may have had percent, can't remember things, the family's rushing in, why did it take so long? So I usually do the next case and I go out and I, with the patient, the family there, I said, you know, we had some unexpected things, but I think you're gonna do fine. And I'd like you to come back this afternoon so I can check your pressure. And we put them at the end of the day so I can sit there and really address immediately what happened. But I like doing it in the office where I can show diagrams. I remind them about the capsular bag that we put the lens in. And I say, this is how, even though we break the cataract up, into two dozen different pieces, they don't go anywhere because they're held by the bag. I usually then talk about the fact that during a part of the cataract surgery, maybe the, the capsule was weak because there were weak zonules, but I talk about the capsule split. And at that point, we, I couldn't get all of the fragments because some of them dropped to the back. I like to use the word split because the word tear kind of has a lot of ambiguity. Did the surgeon tear something he shouldn't have torn? So I like to say it's split open. And then I talk about the eye has the front and the back half. And front of the eye surgeons, we use a different viewing system. And the back of the eye, they use different incisions and different viewing system. And I sort of describe that, you know, it was really tempting to, you know, want to go and, and get all this. But then I thought, if it were my eye, what would be the best thing, really the safest thing, is to have the back of the eye surgeon do it with their, their different technique and their different viewing system. And I think when you say, if I thought about it and if it was my eye, what would I have done? That reassures the patient that you were thinking about them the whole time. I agree with Brian that you apologize. I think it's a, there's an art to having the apology uh, sound like it wasn't your fault because quite honestly, usually it isn't a malpractice, it isn't negligence, and uh, that's why people historically have been afraid of apologizing. So you can simply say, I'm just really, really sorry that you know uh, this didn't go the way you expected. I'm really sorry you're gonna have the inconvenience of another operation. And then you end with what you believe, which is, but I think that we managed it well, and because of that, I think your prognosis is still very good. The recovery may indeed take longer, and I'm very sorry about that, but I think ultimately you're gonna be fine, and you're gonna get a good result. And I think those are the elements that, uh, to me, put the patient in a frame of mind and put you on the same page. It always helps to add, you know, I'm gonna make sure that you are seen by the best retina surgeon, I'm going to be here for you, anything comes up, I'm here to help you and work with you to get the best outcome. So um, with that in mind, I think if that's the worst thing, then if at any point, and despite all the things that we're showing you, there is no problem with stopping at any point and quitting and leaving the nucleus there and sending the vitreo retinal surgeon. I do think it makes sense to clean up the anterior segment of vitreous, which you can with the vitrectomy, put in the eye well, and then let the vitreo retinal surgeon clean it up. And in actual fact, if there's a tiny little fragment of nucleus, they're going to have to go back and get that. And that means if there's 80% of the nucleus still in the eye, it's the same operation. 
So, um, you know, it really doesn't behoove us to be overly heroic. I have no financial interest in anything I'm talking about. Now, this is showing the important step of, you know, here's a dense lens that I think I'm going to be able to fake with it. But one of the signs is that as I crack this through, it's starting to be really mobile. You see the zonas weak, and the left hand side is tilting. And now the temporal clear cornea, and the left hand side of the nucleus is tilting back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch, switch to a manual approach, and I abandon my temporal CCI, and I use a lens loop because I assume there's something wrong with the zonules. I don't want to do my manual expression. A generous incision, I, I do the limbus here, and I get that nucleus out. Then I'm going to clean it up. And uh, you can certainly do any number of uh, scleral or iris suture fixation, but an eight anterior chamber lens uh, works well if it's sized well. Here's another sign, a lot of movement, a rock hard cataract. And I think it's okay to sort of proceed with FACO and see how it goes, but you need to have an exit strategy. It's not all or none. And what you're going to see here is a lot of increasingly lateral mobility. Here, look at that. It's moving so much, and I'm, just, I'm a little worried there. I'm still proceeding to get this fragment out, but now look at how so much of the nucleus disappeared under the iris, and it didn't bounce back. Now I'm thinking I might have a zonular dialysis. Maybe I don't, but is it worth taking a chance? Because this is your chance to exit. And if you can, put viscoelastic underneath, prolapse the nucleus up into the anterior chamber, abandon the clericorneal temporal incision. Very hard to convert a CCI into a good uh, limbal incision. And then go in and extract it. Because again, uh, getting that nucleus out is really uh, you know, the first step. Then you do your cleanup. I've made some incisions. This is a bimanual anterior vitrectomy with split infusion and an anterior chamber lens. Let's just talk a little bit about anterior chamber lens because if you are comfortable with these techniques, scleral or suture fixation of posterior chamber lens is very good. Obviously, if you have an intact rexus, now you can do a sulcus three piece lens with optic capture. Um, but an anterior chamber lens is an equal alternative. So what you're seeing in this course is options, and there's no great, there's no real study that's really answered this for all. There are a number of retrospective studies that show that you know they're very imperfect, right? With the PC rupture, this is a huge uh, variety, a spectrum of complicated eyes, um, but an anterior chamber lens, if you have it in consignment, you have multiple sizes and it's properly sized, is a very uh, good option still if that's what you're comfortable with. You know. uh, Brian, your, your comments in terms of uh, backup IOL? Well. Um, I, I, I too am very sort of comfortable with um, anterior chamber lenses, the angles forward lenses. Mm. There are other options that we know, um, Amo actually elegantly showed there, they glued IOL. Uh, some people prefer um, posteriorly enclavated the artisan lens, the uh, claw lenses. Um, those give good results too. Um, I've been using anterior chamber lenses for many years, and as David said, the, the critical thing is their sizing. You've got to do horizontal white to white plus one. <coughs> but unfortunately, the lens manufacturers are less and less interested in AC lenses, and they're reducing their stock, and some of them stop manufacturing altogether because the amount of stock would expire. So I think this choice is, is getting ever more limited for us. So the first uh, lesson in terms of uh, handling a descending nucleus is how not to get into that position. We get into that position because we don't recognize that there's a small break in the capsule or zonular dialysis. And if you don't recognize it, and it's a brown lens and you keep working, that small defect becomes bigger and bigger until things eventually drop. Uh, so let me just ask the panel, let's list signs that when you're doing a dense lens, signs that you may have a problem. So one of them, excessive mobility. Another is a nucleus that was rotating stops rotating. Another that I showed you was the first case, it's tilting backward. Um, another is a sudden expansion of the pupil, momentary. A sudden deepening of the chamber, momentary. Tipping of the nucleus. Any of these things, again, uh, the tibriis, but it's easy to deny it because when you stop, it looks normal again. 
and uh, that's where we get in trouble. Did, what did I miss? Any other signs of um, early signs of problems with the zonules, problems with posterior capsule? I think that's pretty much it. I suppose you know, you know sometimes you do get uh, prolapse around the side <coughs> and distortion of the pupil is not well dilated. I suppose that's another one. But it, I mean, I think we've covered all the, the critical ones. I think. All right. Uh, now look at this. This is that case where it's suddenly deepened. The chamber suddenly deepened, and I don't show that because I had to turn on the video here at that point. But it looks normal. But there was a sudden deepening, and now I'm just sort of fiddling around, and I decide to pull my instruments out. There's a little extra mobility, uh, and we stop there. And this is the part that is so difficult, because it's like, did I really see that? What did it mean? And you're sitting there looking at this like, well, you know, this is the way it looks all the time. Why don't I just go ahead and continue FACO and continue uh, chopping it? Now, the difference is really important, because... When you have, and I don't have a good example of it, but often you only have one piece or one fragment. And we are conditioned to point that phaco tip right at the nucleus. And we know that if we just give it a little bzz, a little phaco, it's like it magnetically just jumps into our tip. We gobble it up, we go over here, bzz, we latch onto it, gobble it up, and that's how we go. And we don't appreciate that when you have an intact capsule, all of this irrigation flow that's coming out of the sleeve is circulating, and it can't go anywhere. And the phaco tip represents the exit for everything in the anterior chamber, so things naturally flow to it. What changes in a case like this, where the capsule may be open, is that when I point the tip there, if there's no barrier of the posterior capsule, what happens to the hydrostatic flow? We point our phaco tip at the piece, we're pointing the irrigation there, and we're actually pushing it away. And as we push it away, and we go on phaco, now we aspirate, and what comes up? Vitreous. We're close to your capsule, we're possibly vitreous. And that's why it's so easy to do, because we don't visually recognize uh, the anatomy. Let's just show another so the nucleus is ascending. Um, so this is the challenge. You know, you are sitting there with nucleus that wants to drop. You may have vitreous prolapse. You frequently have a small rexus or pupil. That's what got you into trouble. You may have already chopped it or divided it into multiple fragments, and the nucleus wants to drop. So if you can avoid aspirating the vitreous, you can still think about rescuing that nucleus and the cortex, try to preserve at least the anterior capsule, if the rim is there, or as much posterior capsule uh, for the IOL support. And this is sort of the mental image that you need to have when you see one of those signs that we just talked about. And in this case, it's a sudden deepening of the chamber that's caused me to stop. And if you can visualize this, you can kind of realize that now if I point that phaco tip, toward the nucleus, with that much of an opening of the capsule, the irrigation is going to flush into the vitreous cavity, it's going to hydrate it, it's going to want to wash more vitreous forward. And if I aim my phaco tip downward toward the piece, but it's being blown away by irrigation, the aspiration and the phaco itself are more likely to aspirate the vitreous. So what can one do? Well. Charlie Kelman popularized the idea of posterior assisted levitation, PAL. Uh, Richard Packard and I uh, wrote a, a paper with uh, some follow-up on Six Eyes, which is a small series, using uh, the concept of going through the pars plana, but first injecting a dispersive viscoelastic. So that would be visco or helon endocone. Why dispersive? Because it stays where you put it, and that forms sort of a safety net to try to keep things from dropping. And then, instead of a spatula, just to use that same cannula to mechanically levitate pieces up, because you have the advantage of being able to eject more viscoelastic than you need it to maneuver things or push things. So although the shaft, you can't see the whole thing, you do want to either see the tip or see the action of the tip. And this is where you have to be careful, uh, because indeed, uh, it is flying. 
So here's a question. When you have PC rupture, what viscoelastic should you use? So the first problem is, you know, Brian nicely said, don't withdraw, right? And we have this reflex when we are young, we touch a hot stove, we withdraw. That's built into your brain stem. So when you see that, okay, well, wait a minute. I mentally rehearse this. Don't take the instruments out. So what do you do? You stay on position. One. Zero. You go to zero, it's still shallow. It comes up. Then what do you next do? You pull out your second instrument. Then what do you do? You ask for dispersive elastic. So here's the question. You ask, should you ask for a dispersive, a cohesive, a viscoadaptive, which would be heel on five, something in between, which would be MS plus or disco vis? Uh, which would you ask for? Dispersive. How many people say dispersive? dispersive? How many people say cohesive? Few. How about something like heel on five? How about uh, heel on GB? Something really space obvious? How many people would choose disco vis or heel on, I'm sorry, uh, MVIS plus intermediate? All right. So what is the right answer? The right answer is ask for whatever is on the table. Yes. <laughs> You're plugging the dike. You're not going to want them to open a disco. Just hand me something and I'll inject it in the eye and I'll occupy space. And now I can finally withdraw my phaco tip because my hand is shaking at this point and I'm not breathing. Now you can catch your breath and get organized. All right? Now, from that point on, that is, I agree, what you want is a dispersive, what most of you said. And why is a dispersive important when you have an opening in the zonules or in the posterior capsule? Why is a dispersive important? Well, it doesn't come out right away. Usually it's blocking something or supporting something or coating something, and it doesn't come out and wash right out. That's number one. Number two is it will, um, you're not going to get it all out, right? You're not going to go under the IOL. If you're lucky enough to get a PC IOL in there and aspirate there, you're going to leave some behind, and a dispersive is a smaller chain molecule. So at least you won't get a prolonged, protracted IOP spike. You're probably going to get an IOP spike. So what is the worst thing to use if you have a PC rupture? It's probably Helon 5 or Helon GV, things that are really long chain because if you put Helon 5 in, it doesn't come out on its own, and you're going to be managing the pressure for eight days, and you may have to go back and remove it. So think that through. You always want to have a dispersive uh, ready. Um, the next thing is that you are going to have to, with you know, take out vitria. And it's just as Brian said, if the posterior capsule isn't there, the vitreous and the hyaloid face, which is intact here, is what's supporting it. See, see the capsule broke here, the chamber deepened, but the, the, the pieces didn't drop all the way down toward the septum. Why? Because of the hyaloid face. But now we have a problem, which is as you do the vitrectomy, you're going to lose that, and it's when you do the vitrectomy that things will drop down. The exception, of course, is you have a vitrectomized <coughs> eye. If I got in a situation, the pieces will shoot right back. They'll shoot right back. All right, so what I'm doing here is after I bring the pieces up, you're going to have a decision. Do I do a, a manual extraction? Do I continue FACO? And I don't know if Amar, you're going to show the scaffold a little bit later, so I won't go into that. Um, but there are some options there. But what I'm doing here is I'm actually, I know I probably got vitreous prolapse, so I'm levitating things up. And then I'm going to um, bring the pieces up as high as I can toward the cornea, inject viscoelastic, and try to trap them. Um, this is just a traumatic cataract. And you can see there's a truncated area there. I'm going to put a dispersive in there. Uh, I won't go through the whole case. But here I put in some uh, iris retractors to serve as my capsule retractors. Uh, I really like by manual INA when you have an opening in either the zonules or the posterior capsule. And every time before I come out, if I don't repressurize the anterior chamber, I'm going to have shallowing and tendency for vitreous prolapse. This is kind of a nice example of how well a CTR works. You see how it really puts outward pressure for 360 degrees rather evenly, 
And then I get in trouble here because when I try to put this lens in the bag, I can see the whole bag is swinging down like a, a door. <laughs> and it's hinged by some normal zonules. So I kind of back up and I'm going to put this in the sulcus. But you saw how the CTR stretched things out. Now, um, I'm putting it in the sulcus. I'm going to capture the optic. <coughs> and this gives me a uh, two-point fixation in the sulcus. And I'm here I'm just pushing this down, capturing the optic, and thinking that's pretty good. But I'm a little concerned about the CTR having moved a little bit. See how it's not quite as far out there. So even after I remove the viscoelastic, I'm thinking I'm going to put it back in there because I'm not sure that looks good. So let's try some Myocol. <coughs> let's try seeing, yeah, it's, 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 um, the lens is centered, but that CTR has moved <coughs> just a little bit. And here's the Michael. So it's easy to maybe quit here, but I'm thinking, why don't I inject triamcinolone and see what's going on? And <clears throat> this is just to show you how easily we underestimate the amount of vitreous that can prolapse through here. It's transparent. Did anyone think there was that much vitreous coming through there, right? Hmm. So what the heck do we do now? All right, so uh, these are some of the principles <coughs> that you already heard. High cut rate. You have to be able to visualize the point. Whether you go to the limbus, the pars plana, it's still an anterior vitrectomy. And that means you have to see it. You can't go too far posterior beyond the range of focus of your microscope. You want to see the cutting mouth port. It should be facing you if possible. <coughs> we all agree on split infusion. And uh, you, know, you don't need to or want to go through the pars plana with your infusion necessarily. I think it's definitely safe for the limbus. Uh, the chance of uh, retinal breaks, occult retinal breaks, goes up with an infusion cannula through there. So a self-retaining cannula at the limbus, or this very uh, elegant trocar that the Agrawals have uh, devised, are really excellent choices. And then, on, as Brian said, you have to figure out how to set this up. When you're doing vitreous, it should be irrigation cut, aspirate, Cortex, then you can go to irrigation aspirate cut. Uh, so similar points to what Ryan said. Um, now, for years we all use the FACO incision, right? I mean that's what's available to us, but it's too big. And <clears throat> so you could either go through the limbus or you could go through the pars plana, but regardless, I think it should be not the FACO incision, so it's appropriately sized. Some of the problems with the <coughs> FACO incision the anterior approach are it's a very difficult angle, particularly the small pupil or erexus. With a FACO incision, of course, you have a, a leaky incision. So that's, again, why this mantra of lowering the bottle. In fact, I keep the bottle up because I don't want chamber instability. And then you also have this problem <coughs> of if you're going through the FACO incision you're, or the limbus, you tend to pull vitreous forward. And certainly, if you go to the facial incision, you're actually getting a lot of flushing of vitreous out of the incision. It's hard not to remove the viscoelastic that might be holding the pieces up. And so as the vitreous comes out, things drop down. And that's why it's, it's demoralizing there. You're doing the vitrectum, you're doing all these things, and you just helplessly watch the nucleus pop. And it's really this understanding that we've got to have something to support it. And Brian talked about injecting viscoelastic with a dry vitrectomy or aspiration. I think that's clever. What I do is I have levitated things up, and let's say I try to extract some of it, or uh, there's a little bit, and I've been able to fake it over the scaffold. But invariably, I have to address the vitreous, and so I inject this dispersive visco into the anterior chamber, and I lift things up toward the cornea or over the iris, and I just fill the anterior chamber as shown in yellow with dispersive. Then when I go through the pars plana, I'm actually working behind the iris. And so what this does, the pars plana gives me a stable AC, but it gives me a posterior angle of approach toward the vitreous. Um, I'm pulling vitreous into the posterior segment rather than up into the anterior chamber. And most importantly, if I'm using this technique of trapping everything with viscoelastic, I'm not eliminating it. 
and I call this the viscoelastic trap. And I'll show that um, here. So just imagine you have clear vitreous, you can't see it, it's prolapsed. Um, but if you fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic, that's not really tugging on the vitreous. And then you come in with your retractor, and you can see that over in this area, I inevitably transect any bands of vitreous that are bridging their way into the anterior chamber, high cut rate, and I'm staying anterior and staying within the you know, pupillary zone to where I can see that. Then later on, when I feel I've cut things back, if there's no connection here, I can now go in and aspirate the remaining epinucleus or cortex or little nuclear fragments without traction of the vitreous. And that is the principle. So if you are going to do an anterior vitrectomy through the pars plana, you know, you've got to be able to visualize the tip. Make, make sure you use a limbal uh, port, not the three-port pars plana. Um, there's no point in making the sclerotomy really small. You know, our retinal surgeons do that because they have a pressurized infusion, and we just want something smaller than the phaco incision. So, you know, you, uh, use the MVR blade, but uh, don't try to make it too tight, because it's when you force instruments in there that you're going to get breaks. You can do this under topical, um, or you can inject a little bit of the local there, and you know, the, the, this question I think remains unanswered, uh, and this is why it's controversial, because you're already at risk for retinal breaks just by having had a pars, you know, PC rupture and an anterior vitrectomy. And uh, regardless of what you do, if you're not comfortable doing a careful posterior segment exam, peripheral retinal exam, this by all means, remember what we said to the patient, we're gonna work together, make sure you see, get the best care and so forth. And I think when you put it that way, uh, patients um, appreciate that you're do, kind of taking every extra precaution um, and uh, they won't view it as purely an inconvenience. So here is that first case. So now um, I put in the viscoelastic so that I can see. Um, I'm going 3.5 millimeters back because I'm aiming not perpendicular to the sclera, but tangential to it. I'm almost paralleling the iris. And I'm really going right behind the IOL. So this is very much an anterior vitrectomy. But the vitreous is in front of the lens. The vitrector is behind the lens. And you can see how it's all being pulled back in there hmm. because of the posterior location um, of the vitrectomy. And so now a high cutting rate. And again, trying to span the pupil. And I close that sclerotomy with a single adovicral so that we can, uh, and, and uh, we've cleaned it up. Now here is the previous case, and let me show you the conclusion of that. Um, so I've come out, this is in the lower right what we're dealing with. So again, I've done a little cautery, a little cut down, I go in the oblique quadrant to avoid the long ciliaries. I aim toward the, where the back of the lens normally would be, making sure it's adequate. And here's the viscoelastic cannula, I'm injecting a little viscoelastic, and then using this for the PAL technique. And with this large of a lens, this uh, really allows me to bring this nucleus up into the anterior chamber. That's all I'm going to do. And then I have to decide, at this point, how am I going to get this out? Well, I, that's so large, I, I'm now abandoning, you know, I'm up superiorly. I do a little cut down. Uh, and I'm going to convert to a manual ECC. Omar is going to show you the, the scaffold technique, which I think is very valuable if it's a soft lens and you don't have that much. Um, you know, don't worry about trying to shelve it. We want a generous size incision so that we can extract this without um, abrading the corneal endothelium with the nucleus but a little dispersive in between the cornea and the lens. And this is an irrigating lens loop. And if it doesn't come easily, we may have to enlarge the incision. You see how there's a tendency at that point to want to just press it into the cornea and wipe it out. But it's really a sign that I just am not large enough. So a little posterior pressure on the heel of the instrument 
gapes the incision enough, creates a tiny bit of posterior push, uh, and uh, this is hopefully a little bit better for the endothelium. Now this is the visco trap I was talking about. Instead of trying to express this or aspirate it, knowing vitreous is there, we leave it there, but we trap it with visco like shown in this diagram here, okay? So I'm kind of filling the anterior chamber with visco, and I'm going to use that pars planus carotomy after I close my incision to do the two port. See, here's the infusion cannula, and here I'm doing the retractor. I can see it. Now look at how this, all this epinuclear material isn't moving. I mean, I've got an infusion going on, and it's not moving, and that's because it's frozen by this dispersive viscoelastic, which is not being aspirated, and because I'm keeping the vitrectomy tip down low, um, right here, um, it's not being aspirated. Here I'm doing a little bit more visco to push things up. And then using bimanual IMA, and because I have the infusion here, I can use a second instrument to sort of compress some of that epinuclear material uh, into the port. So that's the bimanual IMA. I like to dissociate the irrigation. See how the irrigation is above the iris? I don't want to, if I can avoid it, point the irrigation uh, posteriorly uh, toward the back. Um, and then, so we're going to do that, and then eventually uh, confirm, uh, perhaps with more uh, triamcinolone there. But here again, uh, if I see a little bit, uh, my strategy is to try to uh, bring it up. You can go back and forth with the vitrectomy, back and forth. There's the vitrector again. So I just want to be absolutely sure that there's no vitreous tangled up with there before I aspirate it. And the more I can bring it into the anterior chamber over the iris, the more confident I am that I'm not going to uh, aspirate um, uh, vitreous uh, with the probe. I still have a little vitreous here. We'll bring the pupil down, do a final anterior vitrectomy. But we've got the material out, we bring the pupil down. You know, at this point, you're really behind schedule. This is not the time to do your very first glued IOL, right? So that's why I said earlier, you know, go with what you're comfortable with. You're, you're just trying to get out of town and get to the bathroom. <laughs> and, uh, you know, put in an anterior chamber lens here, uh, and that's what we're going to do here. Best time to learn these intrahaptic, intraspinal haptic fixation techniques is a plan secondary IOL on an aphanic guide where you get all the, you know, you review the Amar's book the night before, and you get all the videos, and you plan it out the night before. This is not the time. Uh, but with the well properly sized, in the end, you know, I have the outcome, MT4 is in the middle, MT3 is smaller, MT5 is larger. And if I get too much tuck, and I can't undo it, I will take out the MT4 and put in an MT3. Uh, the white to white is a guide. If it's 11 and a half to 12, that usually means a normal size. If it's 12 or more, MT5, larger size. Uh, 11 or less, MT3. Those are sort of some rough guidelines. And there's the uh, uh, iridectomy. I'm going to skip over this uh, in the interest of time. No. no. Um, so, well, all right, uh, maybe what I'll do is just show uh, if you, one more case, but, um, you know, this is, uh, I got half the heminucleus out, but then the same thing, I saw this deepening of the chamber, and as much as I hate to admit it, I can't deny it, I probably have PC rupture, so this is, again, 3.5 millimeters back, but I'm going tangential, and so my internal entry is probably 3. The vitreoretinal surgeons that I've repeatedly asked for this, they would recommend 3 or 3.2 back if you go perpendicular to the sclera. And they're going mid vitreous. But I'm working in the anterior vitreous, so I'm going 3.5 back, but aiming in so that my internal entry is closer to 3 millimeters back, obviously. And then this is just showing again <coughs> um, a fairly large heminucleus, isn't it? and it's hidden by the iris. That's why it, it looked kind of tempting that you know maybe you could point the phaco tip and lollipop it into the anterior chamber. And, and that, those are the reflexes that, I, as you repeatedly heard, we get into trouble. 
Uh, don't try to, you know, convert your clear corneal temporal incision. Just go up superiorly. Work in a fresh area because that temporal clear corneal incision, you weren't going to suture it anyway. It's self-sealing. Um, and then, you know, have the <coughs> irrigating lens loop. Uh, I do do manual small incision for really ultra-dense lenses, but, you know, that's as a primary procedure. As a rescue maneuver, I think you go with the limbus and plan to suture it. And again, that's just uh, showing everything, and uh, I won't show the, the rest of that. But <coughs> this is uh, uh, um, some advice. You know, when this happens, it's never expected. And so you're asking the, the nurse to change the machine parameters, now you got to open up a dispersive viscoelastic. Now you want the corneal scissors. You want the lens loop. We haven't used the lens loop in three months. Where the hell is it? So, you know, it's just panic, right? And so one thing you can do is think through what you need to convert. And these are the instruments that you've seen me use just here. Um, this one over here is a Simcoe cannula in case you want to do a little injection subtenons by manual INA self-retaining cannula. Put it, get the favorite instruments you want, put them together in a peel pack, so you call it your contingency kit, and then they open that when you have PC rupture. And you're ready to go if you need to convert, do it by manual, but track me, uh, whatever you need, okay? Um, we call it the contingency kit rather than the emergency kit because you don't want to say, nurse, open up the emergency kit. <laughs> and the patient goes, what, 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 what? what? Um, you know. um, so uh, these instruments that I use are from Katina, but the, the point is get what you need and, and have it ready. Um, I donate all uh, royalties uh, from my books to charity, but uh, this edition, about a third of it is about fake for child, about two thirds is complications and complicated cases. And I try to have videos and, and pictures on everything that's available through Slack. <coughs> and um, we also, through Slack, put together a video course, uh, which is, again, a lot of the same videos you've seen, but it's all on complications and complicated cases. And uh, we've now put this on a website that uh, you can get through the Asterisk uh, website, and it's called the FACO Fundamentals Classroom, and this entire course is actually available for free. You can also buy it from Slack, but it is available for free. <laughs> FACO Fundamentals Classroom, which is something that we've put together, um, uh, and you go to the Asterisk, ASCRS.org homepage. You don't have to be a member, you don't have to pay, for the FACO Fundamentals Classroom. So my wrap up, you know, you gotta do what you're comfortable with. <coughs> this is an advanced course. We're showing you some other ideas to consider. You've got this message. Uh, you know, you do wanna clear the incision, the AC, but don't worry about the nucleus if you're not comfortable with it. AC lenses are fine, but it's the timely referral to the vitreal retinal surgeon that's the important thing. You know, this is not something you want to hide from everyone else in your community uh, and think about, oh, it's a shameful thing. All right? Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much.